TikTok, it's time to rock. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to a midweek special here on the channel. It's a, it's a, a, a great special for us. It's my pleasure, if you aren't familiar, by looking at the face of the guy next to me, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you his name, and, that, and, 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 and surely the name and the face. And, and, and when he says hello, his accent We'll make it all clear to you, but it's my pleasure to introduce to you guys all the way from the UK, John Robson. Thank you for joining us, John. Hello, chaps. Nice to be here. Um, awesome. I'm I'm a big fan of the channel. Uh, I mean, I should. I mean, maybe I'm just saying that, but I am actually. You know, it's. Uh, um, I, do, I don't get a chance to watch a lot of YouTube stuff, but um, this channel is one of the ones that I do try and carve out time to catch up with when uh, when I get free time, which isn't that often. Awesome, awesome. And, you know, um, I appreciate the kind words uh, that you were saying when we were in the green room about our channel. I've got one of our co-hosts here in the chat saying hello. His name is Simon Williams. The Rock Professor is uh, here um, saying hi, John. But thank you for uh, for taking the time and jumping on. Um, a lot of people who watch our channel have been asking and suggesting, why don't you get John Robson on? Why don't you get John Robson on? You know, we've got a couple of Canadian guys who watch us regularly said, get this guy John on. And I said, yeah, I'm trying. I am. I am. And so anyway, the fact that you, uh, you know, reached out after uh, you know we initially touched base and said yeah 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 let's do this let's do this let's let's get together and hang out and talk about the great things in life um, guitars guitar playing and uh, YouTube channels so thank you for joining us. No, not a problem. My pleasure. So, what we're going to talk about then? Uh, okay. Well, well, look. Um, a, a, as I said to you, John, um, I've been watching your channel for a while and. I, I, I think before we get into um, you telling people, you know, your story as far as being a guitar player goes and, and what inspired you and how you got into being, you know, a guitarist and then obviously um, a teacher, uh, uh, tell us a little bit and the viewers about uh, how you started your YouTube channel and, and when you took it seriously because you're a major player, you, you know, in, in – and, and guitar to it. Well, if you key in blues guitar tutorials, you're going to come up. Your name's going to come up in, in the first five uh, hits. So, you know, YouTube have certainly identified you as that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm pleasing the algorithm. Um, well, I mean, as we were saying just before we went live, I mean, um, I uploaded my first stuff to YouTube back in the days when you didn't have a channel. You had a YouTube account. Um, that was in 2008. And it was um, it was just something to do. It was just an, an outlet. It was, you know, I'd put up a video that would, I mean, my early videos, I cringe when I think of them because I didn't know how to make videos very well. Um, but, you know, I'd put up a video and then it would get like 20 views. <laughs> and so, so nobody was watching. Um, and that in a way was liberating because it was like, I could say anything, <laughs> it sure. didn't matter. It was consequence free. Um, and, and, and I had the, I had the, the sort of good fortune to, to be able to make all my mistakes, um, when nobody was really paying attention and learn the craft of, of making videos. I'm still learning, you, you, you know, it's a never ending process, but, um, then you know, 2008, it took 10 years to, to get the first thousand subscribers. So it was hardly a meteoric rise. And then I just did one video um, that, for whatever reason, just kind of tipped things and flipped the coin. And suddenly I went from like 300 subscribers that had taken me 10 years to get to 
a thousand subscribers in a week and boom suddenly i'm monetized and there's a paycheck uh coming from you from youtube and i thought okay time to start taking this a bit seriously then and kind of you know put a bit of thought into the videos and again it was um i was blundering along in the dark making mistakes but you know you hopefully learning from them and since 2018 um it's been just sort of steady away and then i was doing two videos a week until we had the the whole pandemic thing and um it, basically my day job is that i'm a guitar teacher and my only source of income then was people coming to my door for guitar lessons you know local people coming here locally for uh lessons and i thought okay this lockdown is going to really kill that what other source of revenue do i have youtube so i went from two videos a week to doing what i think i do um what i do monday tuesday wednesday thursday live stream on a friday and a sunday video so uh two videos a week to, to that many and then it just kind of you know it's it's become this um this thing that's snowballed and i'm having a massive amount of fun doing it yeah 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 look i gotta agree with you too uh when simon and i the rock professor took over from doing the the show with carl and i you know it took us three or four years to get to a thousand subscribers and uh clearly you know one of the key things that we can always um offer you know uh john and i from from our own perspectives is that you know getting to a thousand is hard work getting to a thousand is gonna but but obviously, if you've got good content and you're doing things right and YouTube like what you're doing, certainly there's something, as John said earlier, in the algorithms. Um, if, 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 if they like it, they're pushing your videos because, you know, we went from 1,000 subscribers, John, and then, you know, to, in two months picked up 2,000 subscribers. So it's just, just uh phenomenal and you know it's hard work because obviously uh the people that watch us too john shared our channel on their social media accounts and one other thing too that i'll always ask and remind people if they want to build a channel ask people to subscribe yeah don't be don't be scared to say say please subscribe to our channel I mean, when you're getting, I mean, the, the people I consider the, the real big players, people like, I mean, to pl pluck a name out of it, thin air, Rick Beato, yeah. he always, at the end of every video, he's he's touting for subscribers. So if it's okay for someone of that stature to do it, then, you know, just crack on and do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and you know, one thing, though, uh, that I've got to say, if you guys aren't familiar with John's uh, channel, go and have a look at his videos. John hasn't changed. John, you know, you know the technical side of his videos clearly has, clearly has, you know, and that's one thing that we have to do a little bit on our channel, John, you know, um, we just have to get a, a better computer so we can do some editing and stuff like that because the computer I've got just won't won't do that. At the moment, we just live stream. But, um, you know, being able to do some editing and some stuff like that certainly is going to enhance your brand. But, you, you know, I, I, I've got to be honest, John, you, you know, you haven't changed. You, you've got that uh, that mate that, that we all know kind of uh, personality. Uh, of genuineness so uh you know good on you for for keeping and continuing to cultivate that no, it's just it's not cultivated it's just I, I turn on the camera and i just talk like i'm talking to i can't remember who it was who said it but i remember hearing this piece of advice i can't remember who it was said by or who it was said to but it was um you know you don't act like you i mean act like you're talking to ten thousand people Act like you're talking to one person and that, that's Correct. just that that yep. sort of resonated with i did have a little bit of a, a sort of tiny little foray into the world of broadcasting before this though i was i used to host a, a show on a, a tiny little community radio station in in red car where i live and i think again just the experience of that stood me in good stead like you know being able to kind of um I mean, I swear like a sailor when I'm not when I'm, when I'm, I'm, I'm not on YouTube. But you know, it, it's you, you have to have that um, 
well, if you want to, if you want to keep your videos monetized, you have to have that uh, filter there that just kicks in automatically. So you can be genuine and, and, and act normally, but without the profanity. So, um, yeah, yeah. That's, that's yeah, about yeah. the only affectation that I would say I do do for YouTube. Is to... Yeah. And, 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 you know, I've accidentally, um, slept a couple of times with a couple of, uh, uh, swear words, uh, but we, 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 we generally try not to on our channel. And I'll tell you why, John, the, 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 the main reason why we decided that we wouldn't do that is because we wanted to take seriously what we do. So if we were offering an organic fans perspective on the Beno album, and 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 people are going to use that and and your channel and your opinions, what you offer on your channel in the future as reference material, and you're you're there giving it so in a digital form. Well, you, you know what's the point in carrying on like you you know you, you know you're in the workshop you know talking to your mates. So so and 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 you want I want I want family members to be able to watch my videos too that that know me and go. Oh yeah, you know, and I'm sure the same thing with you too, John. You know, you want people to to watch you and and actually, you know, um, not be too upset by all the carrying on that you would do normally with uh, a couple of mates down at the pub. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, a fair proportion of my um, student base are you know kids, you know, yeah. sort of adolescents. So it's yeah, it you you've got to kind of think of that if they're you know, um, if, if they're saying, um, if they're watching me on YouTube and I come out with uh, a string of effing and jeffing and their parents, what is your guitar teacher saying? <laughs> uh, um, so, but it's rock and roll, mum. It's rock and roll. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> yeah. Hey, um, so... I, I suppose one of the key things that we always like to do when we get a guest on our um, channel, John, is offer them an opportunity to to talk about your musical journey. Y y you know, uh, what inspired you, what band, what artist, okay. um, uh, what record was it that 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 made uh, that impact to you? for you to get on well i'm going to be a guitar player i'm i'm going to be a musician so um do you want to share that experience yeah. with us please yeah i mean i think it was just inevitable because uh, i mean my the, the first piece of music that i ever remember hearing that made me think okay what is that um i was like really young a toddler preschool and I heard Apache by the Shadows. Wow. Um, up to that point, up to that point in your life when you're two or three years old, music is the wheels on the bus go round and round. You know, and it's just. <laughs> but then I heard this on the radio, and it's like it was the first time I, I couldn't articulate it or think of it like that. But I do, in retrospect, I do remember thinking that was the first time I realised music could make me feel that happy. Yeah, um, and. Growing up in the seventies, it was, I mean, something like the shadows, you know, um, had a bit of a resurgence then and, you know, fifties rock and roll. That was, that was the big thing. You know, Greece was the big movie in the cinemas. Happy days was a big show on TV and countless fifties rock and roll revival bands in, in the top 40. So I was exposed to a lot of that. And, um, you know, just this, this notion that, that that cliche that you only need three chords and you can play all this sort of stuff. Well, I, was, I mean, the, the 11 year old me thought, well, how hard can it be? You know, so <laughs> I got the, um, I got my first guitar from uh, my mother's mail order catalog and um, set about learning how to play Johnny Be Good and the, all, all the kind of rock and roll hits. And then you're only kind of, this far away from blues, you know, so yeah. via probably from fat stomach. I'll tell you one that was a big uh, one for me was, um, I mean, this one single really did spark a, a, a bit of a thing for me. Um, the straight, straight cats, straight cat strut. Oh. It was the first time I'd heard, you know, kind of jazz chords played like that. And that, that sounded like kind of exciting and exotic. And the B side, if you're not aware of it, 
check out the b-side of stray cat strut it's a live blues jam um from a concert they did at newcastle city hall it's called drink the bottle down and brian setzer is absolutely playing out of his skin on that and just just factor in the fact that you know when he's playing guitar like that on this uh, six or seven minute uh blues thing uh he's 22 years old correct yeah. and it's are you familiar with the track Yes, I'm familiar with uh, uh, the Straight Cats. I, uh, in fact, in fact, I just brought a cheap court Yorktown. Okay. I got rid of a Gretsch a couple of years ago, and I, I wish I didn't get. I wish I kept my Gretsch. So I brought a cheap York uh, town just to play a bit of rockabilly, John. <laughs> yeah. if, you, if anybody's not familiar with that that song, "Drink the Bottle Down" by the Straight Cats. If you like blues guitar, go and check it out. And so that that single you know the kind of the a-side getting me into all these kind of augmenteds and whole mm. talk scales and stuff like that and the b-side with this this incredible blues guitar playing uh, and that was just like okay this is this is the direction i want to go in i was probably about what 14 15 by then and um uh, and that sort of set the template really yeah, Brian is amazing, isn't he? I'm, I'm glad you mentioned him. Um, there's a couple of things that, that memories that are burnt into my mind. His version of Summertime Blues on La Bamba. I remember I was a young guy. I went to the movies to, to, to see that because, you know, it was the rage. But that was the one thing in that movie that I thought was absolutely cool when he comes out and he's acting as Eddie Cochran and he just, yeah. oh, Fantastic movie. Um, haven't watched it in ages. Um, yes. Uh, Lou Diamond Phillips, wasn't it? <laughs> Correct, right. yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Correct. And he's, you know, he does a pretty good job. Um, yeah. You know, obviously he's not a guitar player and he's trying to do the best that he can when he's playing that uh, Fender. But, yeah, it's interesting that you should um, talk about Stray Cats because they were big here um, in 81, 80 when I was a young guy. You know, I, I was around around the age that you were just saying yourself, 13, 14, 15, around that, that and it was phenomenal. It was un, it was something that, that, that um, uh, w there was nothing like it on the radio for, for a starter, John. All the other stuff on the radio at the time, certainly over here, was all that sort of Depeche Mode, Human League. Correct. Uh, synth pop and you had maybe Duran Duran um correct yep. uh, but this was just so it was just a guy with a um a double bass a guy with a Gretchen a guy with a drum kit that consisted of a cymbal and a snare drum <laughs> you know um and it was just so honest yeah you know? yeah 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 and, and and I've been a fan of uh Brian you know ever since you know and he plays with how to pick Basically, well, he, he he actually slides a pick. He he sneaks a pick in, but but most of the time, um, doesn't he, John? He's he's just ma mainly finger picking. Yeah, yep. Yeah. He's um, you know, he's obviously well. The Gretsch is a bit of a giveaway, but he's obviously listened to a Chet Atkins tune or two in his time. <laughs> Um, uh, Simon said that he saw the Stray Cats supporting Dave Edmonds on their first UK tour. Did you ever get a chance to see them live, I John? I, I didn't, unfortunately. Um, I was of an age where, you know, um, parental uh, control being what it was, I wasn't allowed to go to, to, to those kind of rowdy rock and roll kind of shows. And um, so I, I never got the chance to, uh, to go and see them. Wish I had, but, you know, hey. There's bigger things to regret in life. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 how did you get? You know, what 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 were the steps for you to get into? You know, we were just talking on off air before mm -hmm. we went live about this album here. If you guys aren't familiar with it, we've already ranked this album yeah. on on the uh, on the channel. Um, it's the second album, uh, yep. "Hard Road" by John Mayle. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated because I'm very familiar with your synopsis on this album. You did a couple of videos on Peter Green and, and why you think this album is a standout. Peter Green is very, very close to a lot of the things that we do on this channel. Can, can you share with us, John, 
please, your, your experience and, and your uh, synopsis on, on this album and Peter Green, because I think it's fascinating, the connections that you've well, made. Well, one th I mean, you know, having discovered blues via the Stray Cats, um, that one um, B-side, and, you know, kind of getting into it a little bit through rock and roll, you get into blues, the one name that, that, you, that is unavoidable is Clapton. Um, sure. You know, and um, the track Layla was, it was actually being used as, a, as the theme for a TV show, um, just a locally produced TV show here, and I was just like, is that music, you know? And it oh, was, wow. it, um, it was lit, this thing called Layla by Eric Clapton. So you go out, you buy the Derek and the Dominoes album, get into all the blues on that. And then, you know, the, the whole Clapton thing, people are talking about this album he did with John Mayle and the Blues Breakers. So you go and check that out. Oh, that's pretty good. So then you go and check out more John Mayle stuff. And that was the next album that I found. And, um, I, I've, I've got a bit of uh, flack for saying this in the past, but I think the Beano album, I mean, it's a good album, um, but Clapton's playing on that is still a work in progress, I think. He, he didn't really, you know, by the time you get to the Layla album, his playing has, you know, that that's him. And I think that's probably about, I don't think he's ever bettered that album. Uh, but you listen to A Hard Road and suddenly you realise that, like, there's, there's this guy, Peter Green, and... He's, you know, he's, he's playing on, I mean, the, the supernatural, for example, and, um, you know, and um, someday after a while and um, you don't love me and just all of these fantastic tracks, um, you know, and, and he's playing just, just from a technical ability and from a, um, from a phrasing point of view and note choice and everything. He was at that point the, the the kind of player that Clapton would later become, but I don't think Eric had got there yet. And you know, for all of the people who think that you know Peter Green is all about kind of the slow, um, well chosen, sparsely populated notes, and you know, j well, just have a listen to the stumble. He's absolutely tearing it up on there, you know. Um, so you know, he had the, he had the kind of for the time. For the time, you know, he had the speedy chops um, that that were pretty much unparalleled at the time. Um, you know, I'm not going to by today's standards, you wouldn't call it shredding, but you know, by the by the standards of mid to late '60s, you know, it was it was streets ahead. And I just think it's a stronger album. I, 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 it, it, it's just um, a, a great, great album, and I'll never ever tire of of hearing it and um the only thing and i have to say this and this is something that again i'll probably get some flack for um you know peter green peter green's guitar playing on that album is it, it's worth listening to the album for and the price you have to pay is john mail's vocals because <laughs> it's just yeah uh i i i just i i i really struggle with john mail's voice um, a lot you, of the time you're not alone you're not alone on that because we've ranked this album and we've ranked the Beano album and we've spoken about the Beano album on at least half a dozen shows John mm. and and I am um, outspoken on John Mayo's vocals to it it's 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 a, a harsh listen a harsh listen it's mm -hmm. you know and I've been listening to the album for for a long long time but you know, yeah, yeah. So, so I'm on your side there when it comes to his vocals. Um, uh, the guitar playing though is uh, phenomenal. Interesting that you should say that because we were lucky enough about a year ago to have uh, Ramon Goose on the channel from the Guitar Show, another Englishman, mm -hmm. and he he said um, that he loves the Beano album too, like all of us. Clearly, he situates very clearly why that album is important because it's the marriage of you know the les paul and the and the and, and the gibson yep. and, and and that whole british electric blues thing came you know from from that point but he said something interesting and 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 i think it's worth mentioning that you know clapton's very angry on that album you, you know he's a young guy and he's very angry and you can hear that and and you know he's he's on the money, right? and then which you know we get you with your your perspective, 
And he says, if you go and listen to this album here, mm-hmm. you know, you, you, you're listening to, to a guy, even though it's his first album, but you're listening to a guy that's very comfortable in his playing, knows yeah. his tone, and, and he's presenting it in a, in a different way that Clapton did with the Beno album. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, yeah. Spot on analysis. Yep. Uh, you can... Ramon, he, he knows his stuff too. Sorry for interrupting. You know, he, he, he's like us. You know, he's been listening to, 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 to Fleetwood Mac and Peter Green for years. W- one other little thing, though, that I want to back your argument up with or your, or your, your, your opinion. If you go and listen to that uh, uh, John Mayo Live Volume 1 and Volume 2, I think it came out a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. and it's phenomenal. And listen to the way that Peter's playing guitar, and it's, it's, it's this. It's in, yeah. you know, so the continuity, John, from this album and the live playing in, in that era, it's phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it, I think the, the Hard Road album often does get um, it's overshadowed by the Beano album because, I mean, um, the Beano album, as you say, you know, it was the it was the Les Paul, and it was you know kind of overdriving a Marshall. And yes, we'd heard distorted guitar sounds before, but not like that. Um, and you know, so th- th- in that sense, it was you know an important album. And um, but I still prefer I still prefer the Hard Road. So there you go. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I just think, uh, yeah, it's a phenomenal album. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. And then obviously it goes on another l- slight little detour when he gets Mick Taylor in there, doesn't he? You know, yeah. <laughs> with, with uh, Crusade, uh, and 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 it's like, oh my gosh, <laughs> can it get any better? You know, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, phenomenal work, though. Um, one of the great things about John Mayall. Um, it's his his spotting of talent, isn't it? Remarkable. Yeah. I mean, Walter Trout. There's another guy. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I first, it gosh, it was the mid '80s sometime, and um, I'd been to the pub and came back flicking around late night TV, and there was this uh, gig on Channel 4 in the UK, this well after midnight. And it was um, it was called Live at the Maintenance Shop, uh, John Mayles Blues Break, because it was in some American venue. And it was uh, it was that lineup of uh, the Blues Breakers where they had Walter Trout and Coco Montoya. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, Coco's rig, was he was having problems with it. Uh, like, he, you know, you just couldn't hear him. And um, so Walter was taking solo after solo after solo after solo. I'm thinking, who is this? You know, and um, you know, uh, and unfortunately, uh, Mel kind of at some point in the in the evening's proceedings introduces Walter Trout as as the guitar player. So that's a name to watch out for. And then um, you know, not not long after uh, that, Life in the Jungle. That his first album comes out, so I was all over that like a rash, you know. Fantastic stuff. I mean, again, when when he's just one of those players that the kind of player that I love, where when you analyze what he's doing, it's which I do. That's my job. Um, you know, you think, well, that's really simple. You know, okay, he's playing it with a bit of a bit of fire and a bit of flash, but he's it's just accessible pentatonic you know kind of licks that anyone can can get the fingers around but it's just the way he plays them his phrasing his is just his his whole kind of playing for the song um you know kind of way of doing it he's he, incredible guitar player awesome awesome um Guys, if anybody is uh, going to be watching uh, this uh, show on um, replay, I'll attach uh, John's um, YouTube channel somewhere on this um, 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 video for you to go and check out. What, one of the key things that obviously John does on his channel is that he offers really, really good lessons 
for people from from any kind of experience to get involved in. One of you know one of the great things, John. I I, I think about a great guitar teacher is just the uh, the ability to cut through the waffle and just present and and get to it and and, and just present it into in, in a form that's easily digestible. Now that works for me. I've learned a lot of stuff watching your videos. So so I, I'm probably jumping the gun a little bit here because we're not talking about how you got into, but we'll come back to it. How you you know um, uh, your professional. Um, gigging stuff but but y- y- you know the, the way that you present your lessons was, was this something that you thought about how you were going to do or was it just something that naturally came to you that this is this is something that 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 you've just done well i mean it goes back to the, of how i learned it you know um when i learned about scales and chord construction and harmony and sort of stuff like that i learned it by figuring it out on the neck and it was like okay so if i add that note and that note is four frets above that note and and then okay and so then we add that note two frets under that note that that's the way i kind of figured it out i wasn't aware of think of terms like perfect fifth and flattened fifth and major third and stuff like it was like how many frets away from this note is that note and how do i add that in Okay. And, and that was the way I made sense of it. And it was later on that I discovered all the kind of textbook terminology that, that describes that sort of stuff. So if if that way made sense to me, you know, because a, a lot of people tend to kind of teach it and, okay, and um, and, and this is a major third and, and that is a flattened fifth and learn to recognize it. No, okay, tell people what, you know, that the, these notes are this far apart or what are these two chords are that far apart or whatever and then get them using it and then say okay by the way that's called and you know so so don't start off with the jargon and then try to demystify the jargon to start off with the practical use of it and then you know kind of say oh and by the way there's a there's this name that we give that, that that's the way i've i've tried to um you know kind of organize things yeah, it's, I it. isn't it interesting being a guitar yeah. teacher i've spoken to a couple of them over the years and you, you know so you get this uh, guy that comes along john and he says i want you to teach me wipeout yeah he doesn't want he doesn't want to know the you know he wants he wants to be able to by the end of the week play wipeout so you'll sit there and you'll and you'll show him how to play wipeout is, is, mm-hmm. you, you know you would you do that yeah well I take the view that the you know uh, the customer is paying me, so um, you know I will. The, 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 when you get a student like that, that is kind of I want to learn this one piece, and I don't want to go yeah. through all of the, the the kind of the, the preamble uh, that gets me there. So you'll start off showing them the piece, and then inevitably uh, there'll be some technical thing that they can't do, like they can't play the bar chord or they, you know, they can't stretch their fingers to, to reach this note in the t- part of the riff or something. So you think, well, okay, well, he is, he is something that he is a little exercise. Do this for five minutes before you start playing the tune. And, you know, this will help you be able to do that. So you kind of sneak it in under the radar like that, you know, the, 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 the sort of, <laughs> if, if someone knows that, practicing a scale or an exercise is going to help them play what they want to play and they can attest to the fact that well yeah but i can't play it I, it's it's too difficult for me to, to kind of reach that note in the melody then oh but my guitar teacher says if i practice this then uh, it'll help then it usually kind of works that way and quite often you'll get people who just want to learn one thing um and that's it that's all they want to do and then you know the, the at some point the, the 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 bug bites and they want to yeah. know more and they want to know why and the, you know so it's uh, but as i say if, if somebody just wants to learn one thing and that's all they want to do um then hell their money's as good as anyone else's you know yeah that's the way um we've got uh eight people watching us john um we got some people in the chat. We'll, we'll do a quick uh, shout out. We've got Tim Thomas, a very good friend of the channel. Thomas Santiago is in here. 
I want to do a special shout out to Helene O'Hara from uh, Melbourne, Australia, joining us. Scratch Zeppelin, another good friend of the channel here, and the Rock Professor. We've got John ZD351 in uh, the chat as well, another great friend of the channel from Melbourne, Australia. And if I've missed anybody, I'm just quickly strolling through. Um, say hi. If you guys have any questions for John, just fire them in, in the comments and I'll do my best to flick them up. Um, we're going we're gonna to hang around here for another hour um, just talking guitars and music and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, like I say, if you guys have any questions, and, again, if you guys are watching the replay, and if if you've got any questions for John, go go and follow John on his channel and ask the questions over there. I'm sure he'll be happy to to answer any questions you have. So so, John, you you fell in love with music as a young guy. You got a guitar. Did you go out and hit the the stage? Did you did you oh, get yeah. the transit van, John, and throw yeah. the amps in and go on tours? Um. First gigging experience was uh, in school bands playing. I mean, we had a very, very fortunate that um, my music teacher at school was just a young guy fresh out of university and he was playing in a band. And so he was kind of encouraging us fledglings to, to create bands. And uh, the school music room on a on a lunchtime or the music department, because there was a bunch of different rooms, there were, there were always bands rehearsing there, you know. Wow. Um, you know, it was round about the time when you know oh, what what what's a cool song that we can learn and it's easy. So there were how many versions of Eye of the Tiger by Survivor being belted out on, you know, um, by various bands there. and you know playing Christmas concerts at school and school assemblies and stuff like that. And then um, just some of the guys I was playing with there started forming bands that would go out and gig on the local pub circuit when I was about 15 years old. So I was doing that and then graduated on to um, like the, the working men's club scene, you know, where you're playing sort of cabaret top 40 sort of stuff. And you know, that was a great experience because, you know, would I otherwise have, um, you know, learned to play, Simply Red songs or, you know, Hue and Cry or, no, no I wouldn't, you know, because um, it wasn't in my wheel, but in my wheelhouse. But, you know, you, you you learn to take on board music that you wouldn't necessarily listen to or particularly want to play. But, you know, hey, it's in the set and you got to, so it, it developed, it, it developed my sort of professional sensibilities to, you know, well, okay, I'm doing this to earn money. I've got to, you know, kind of make a, a decent fist of it. Um, so I did a good decade or so playing on that circuit whilst also playing, you know, with fun bands. The the, the, the whole kind of working men's club kind of cabaret sort of that, that sort of circuit. It was usually Fridays, Saturdays and, Saturdays and Sundays. So then there'd be, you know, the kind of fun bands on a Tuesday night or a Wednesday night or something where you could just go and, jam and play blues or you know do original sort of stuff um and yeah i did a a, a good shift um for as i say for a good 10 years or so doing that and then well it's the old joke isn't it um you know what's the difference between a working musician and a large pizza the pizza can feed a family um <laughs> you know um uh, 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 and i was just thinking this isn't this isn't paying i'm not paying the rent here you know so I put a little advert in the um in the local free newspaper guitar lessons um just to try and get some regular kind of income coming in uh thinking it, that'll do as a sideline but gradually it, it sort of took over um and yeah that's, people i mean i don't gig anymore um and people ask me if I'm if I miss it. Well, I'm I miss the idea. I miss the idealized, uh, romanticized version of it. But you know, um, in reality, you know, leaving the house at five o'clock on an evening to get back in the other side of midnight to have earned fifty quid, playing, you know, to people who are more interested in 
the game of bingo, then it it, it, it did sort of uh, lose its charm by the end. I, I enjoyed it. I'm glad I did it, but um, it's a box that I've ticked and I'm doing other things now, you know? Good. And I, I, look, I think one of the great things, though, John, about uh, you, you you know, playing regularly for that long period of time is that you've, you've learnt a lot of practical examples, you know, a lot of practical experiences, you know, that that you can pass on through your through your guitar lessons. And, you, you know, if, if you go and do any kind of research, you know, the good guitar teachers are the ones that have been gigging, you know, that have stood there and, like John was saying, and do five sets or three sets a night, you know, and, um, and, 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 and just cut through all the crap. Um, yeah, as opposed to, you know, I, I, again, I'm not going to um, single any anybody out, but, um, you know, uh, going to, to, to a music college, uh, where you haven't really played a gig, and then you know, try and try and pass on some kind of lessons can be one-dimensional, and uh, I think people prefer prefer the, the the full 3D offerings that guys like yourself can give. Yeah, well, it's um, you know, it, it it's as I say, I just. I, I started the lessons just as a sideline and it, it sort of, uh, it, it kind of took over really. Um, so, you know, I'm, I get up every morning and what am I going to do today? Oh, I'm going to play the guitar. You know, I mean, I, I work seven days a week. I don't have a day off. Uh, me and the missus, we haven't been away on holiday since 2015 um it's a full-time thing you can't i can't take my foot off the gas at all but you know i'm not complaining i love what i do and it's um it's just the best job in the world really yeah i i, I i've got to i've got to kind of stick up for for, for guys that, that that play in in um bands that, that do a regular kind of circuit. I've mentioned this before on this channel. You, you know, when I was 19 years old, um, I was friends with a with a guy and uh, we were having a couple of beers at his place and they had all this money. He had these shoe boxes, three shoe boxes filled, John, with $5 and $10 bills. And we were saying, how, how did, you know, where, where, where did you get this money from? This is a true story. And anyway, um, we found out that he was a drummer, but he never told us for four years that he was a drummer because he was a drummer in a dance band at the Cosmopolitan Club on a Saturday night where they would go and put the talcum powder out on the floor and he'd sit there. And, and he was a good drummer, but he wouldn't tell anybody that because, you know, he, uh, there was this so-called stigma around it. Um, but we, we looked at him, John, and we said, man, we don't give a damn. Mate, you're getting paid. Look at all this money, bro. <laughs> <laughs> who, who cares? <laughs> oh, I mean, you know, just thinking back to, I, I won't name the band, uh, but uh, there there was an, an absolutely awful, awful country band that I was in uh, for a couple of years in the mid-90s. And um, it was just dismal. Um, not because of the of the music, because you know I, I don't mind a bit of country music, but just the, the the guy who was like running the band, he was insisting that he did all the backing tracks, and he, you know, because it was it was basically um, me on guitar and. Um, him on bass and a girl singer and everything else was was sequenced and you know he just could not put backing tracks together like you know I mean we used to do um, what was it uh, Lucille the old Kenny Rogers song and which if you're familiar with that song it's a waltz it's in 3-4 well he'd put a 4-4 backing track together with it and then you know and it just never sounded right because the drum, that the snare drum was landing in the wrong place and all kinds of stuff like that. And I hated it. But you know what? It was one of the, we just kept getting bookings. We just kept, because line dancing was the big thing at the time. And every, every pub and every 
working men's club was wanting a country band, you know, and so there were just there was a shortage of bands who were doing that material. So it was like um, a seller's market, and we were working regularly and it was good money and and but it was just you know bad backing tracks he, he this this guy actually as well um he was he was an opera singer he was a trained opera so you you know and he was trying to kind of tone down the opera kind of um vibe to his voice but when you've got you know, somebody that sounds like Luciano Pavarotti trying to sing Achy Breaky Heart. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just, uh, you know, the, the, I'm feeling like I'm, I'm embarrassed here up on stage, you know, big grin on my face, Stetson, bootlace tie, you know, uh, I don't want to be here, but then, you know, you get the, the you get the money at the end of the month and it's like, okay, I'll, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll do it for another month. Oh, isn't that amazing? So, yeah, you know, yeah. So, again, I have to back up the point that I made earlier, ladies and gentlemen. You know, John's got that experience. So, so you know, uh, pay pay attention to the advice given to you by ex gigging uh, guitar teachers. Um, yeah. It's it's going to be you, you know you you're not only paying for the lessons, you're paying for advice. <laughs> Um, John, so one of the things uh, at the top of the show that we spoke about was, uh, and, and off air, was the fact that, uh, and, and one of the great things about your channel too is that uh, you take every opportunity you can to push and get people into playing guitars. And if budget is, uh, is a, a consideration for people, well, you, you know, um, there's there's options available for people in yeah. fact you know I, i've seen a lot of your videos where you'll go on the major chains websites and and you'll highlight guitars and you'll talk about guitars and you'll point out why this guitar from your experience might be a better buy as opposed to this guitar what you could do to this guitar so you know that's that's one of the great things that you do as well well yeah i mean I mean, you're of a similar vintage to me, so you no doubt remember the awful instruments that, you know, were the only only guitars you could afford back in the late seventies uh, when you when you start playing when we started playing then, and you know, even as as I mean, I can remember a change um, in the early nineties. I think it was ninety three when Yamaha brought out the first um, Pacifica one twelve where suddenly overnight you know it was not acceptable to pay 200 pounds for a guitar made of plywood because before then you know it was if you were buying a guitar that was 200 quid or less it was going to be made of plywood and it was going to have horrible pickups and it was going to slice your fingers on the fret ends and that was just the the stuff that you had to deal with and that was you know if you don't like it well work harder save up and buy a buy a better guitar but you know with that pacifica guitar um you know the um y yamaha changed the industry and from then on in really from a say like 93 94 onwards you have to work really hard to buy a bad guitar of course any mass-produced product you're always going to get a bad one slip through and people will say oh i bought one of those and it was it was awful well yeah i'm sure you did but Steve, he's got Get that light up my face. Yeah. I bought one of those. It was awful. Well, yeah, but, you know, I've played awful Fenders and awful Gibsons, you know, so any a, a bad one can slip through the net in, in, in any factory. Um, but these days, I mean, when I first started doing guitar reviews, as I said, back in 2018 when, when um, I started taking the channel seriously, um, you know, I soon cottoned on to the fact that review videos were the ones that were getting me the most views right okay i need to do review videos what's the best what, what, what's the cheapest guitars i can get my hands on to keep a, a, a stream of review videos so i, I cottoned on to um, harley benton guitars and they have their detractors they have their haters um but i'll defend them to the hilt um i you know I've got um, two of their guitars on the wall behind me. There's a, you can see there. There's a black PRS copy in the corner with uh, P90s, 
And the acoustic you can see there is a Harley Bent, and they're both fantastic guitars, and you know, cheap as cheap as chips. Um, and you know, I mean, my not my first electric guitar, but me, the, the, my, one of my first electric guitars was a Satellite Les Paul copy that cost, um, I think, £80 in 1981. And it was made of plywood, and it had um, horrible, scratchy-sounding uh, single-coil pickups inside humbucker covers. And uh, and, and it gets worse when you... Because I, I was always wanting to kind of rip things to bits and have a look and see what's inside. Open the pickups up um, to see what was inside. And turns out, when you look on the inside of those kind of fake humbucker covers... It, they were old Pepsi cans that had just been kind of cut into sheets and bent in, into the right shape. Um, and so that was the satellite Les Paul copy. And that was, I threw a set of DiMaggio super distortion humbuckers into that because, you know, those were the pickups to have in that, in those days. And, you know, that was my first gigging guitar. Um, it's awful guitar, but it, you know, I think when you when you start on a on a bad guitar, then um, or when you have a, a when you start on a guitars like that, then you know they're very unforgiving. They don't let it get let you get away with bad habits, which is that sort of made me a little bit less tolerant these days of beginners who turn up with um, like a fourteen year old kid who'll turn up with a Fender Stratocaster, you know, um, and oh well, this is too difficult. Yeah, we'll try doing it on the guitar I learned on Sunshine, you know. Um, yeah. So, yeah, budget guitars these days, um, you really, really, really have to want to to spend the money on a brand and um, and and you know pay the extra for for that brand. I mean, I've just done it myself. I just recently bought this, you know, and it's a lovely guitar. Oh, he's gone. Oh, I'm presenting you. I thought you were going to show a guitar. Oh, okay. There we go. Yes. Sorry, there we go. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is um, my latest acquisition. It's a, it's a Les Paul tribute. And Wow. Um, is it a better guitar than a 200 quid Harley Benton? Not really. Not really. You can, you know, I, there's nothing I can do on that that I couldn't do on the, uh, the Harley Benton SC550. Um, but that has the word Gibson on it. And I just, for sentimental reasons, I wanted a guitar with that brand name on it. So I understand why people do, um, you know, love the big brands because, you know, that we're all human and they have a, an allure that, um, that is, you know, very tempting. But at the same time, I'm not going to kind of say, oh, you know, play authentic. Only a Gibson is good enough because, no, Harley Bent will do the job. Oh, look, I'm going to agree with you. And this is one of the things that we've spoken about a couple of times on this channel too, John. You know, so there's a couple of things that I want to, you know, throw into the conversation. F first of all, you and I and a lot of guitar players have traveled that road of, of the cheap, nasty, horrible guitar. If you gave me a Fender Stratocaster as my first guitar when I was 14 years old, I would never appreciate, John, what a Fender Stratocaster is was because I didn't play some of these awfully horrible setup guitars um, um, uh, as I progressed. And, and look, I've got to uh, stick up um, and agree with what you're saying too. I've got classic vibe Stratocasters. I'm a classic vibe nut. I've got, I've had, I've got a 60s classic vibe Stratocaster that I've had since 2008. I've changed the pickups uh, to Tone Riders. Just, mm -hmm. just to a little bit hotter ones to the Texas uh, special uh, versions from from the standard ones in it, and that's just as good, John, as any of my American Stratocasters. I've got a fifties uh, Telecaster Classic Vibe that was probably better than my American one, and that was the one that had the brass saddles. The made in China Classic Vibes were very good. Um, the that that. That Jaguar, made in Indonesia, Jaguar classic vibe. Mm -hmm. um, um, I've played Epiphone uh, Les Pauls, and I've got the vintage brand uh, Lemon Drop, which is the tribute to uh, Peter Green's um, Les Paul. Now, 
do they sound and 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 play just as good as my four thousand uh, dollar Gibson Les Paul? Well, you you know, m- m- mate, there's not ten times worth of differences between them. No, this this is it. I mean, th- th- this is what people often uh, don't kind of remember, which is that if you take a style of guitar like a Les Paul, for example, yep. you know. There is a range, there is a spectrum of sounds that you can expect to get out of a Les Paul, you know, and you take two identical Les Paul standards, uh, same year, same production run and everything, they'll weigh different, they'll sound different, they'll feel different. Um, you know, so as long as any guitar that I can, that, that I play is in that ball, ballpark, and I think, yeah, well, this this is kind of, you know, in that spectrum of sound, feel, kind of weight and everything, then for me, it's it's it it, it fits the bill. You know, it's it, it's like. I mean, that said, I did do um, a blind test a few months ago um, between one of the uh, the newer Epiphones. You know, the um, the inspired by Gibson Epiphone Les Pauls. Yes. Did a blind test. Um, on the channel, um, between that and a Harley Benton Les Paul copy, and I, I just threw it open to um, the viewers. Like, if you can tell, because it was like a full full track mixed, you know, kind of rhythm guitar, lead guitar, solos, riffs, and stuff. If you can tell which guitar is happening at which point in the track. So if you say, okay, 30 seconds in, you swap from the, the Epiphone to the Harley Benton and vice versa and stuff like that, then uh, you've won a £50 Amazon voucher. Nobody got it right. Not a single. Wow. wow. So that was like, you know, um, as I say, one of the newer, highly regarded um, Epiphone uh, Les Paul, I think it was the Epiphone Les Paul Classic. And um, a two hundred quid Harley Benton, and no one could, no one could discern the difference. Well, well, yeah, I I, I did a similar thing um, on a Sunday here at our, our local uh, uh, gear shop. Um, I and it was a blues breaker amp that they had, mm. and it was on the Sunday, and they had a ten thousand dollar Les Paul, one of the custom shops there. And I've just had uh, the the lemon drop, an- an- another version of the lemon drop. And these are the guys that work in the store, and they couldn't tell the difference, mm-hmm. you know, a, a, a tone. T- so, 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 but, but the only difference, obviously, clearly with these guitars is that a $10,000 Gibson Les Paul is going to be worth something when you go and sell it. You yeah. know, uh, a, a lemon drop, when I go and sell that lemon drop, uh, John, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get. You know, uh, the, the the money that that I paid for it, unless you know Keith Richards happens to come over and play it, and I've got a photo yeah. with him playing it. You know, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's Red Shull, um has a brilliant line. You know, when he talks about you know cheap guitars, and um, you know he, he describes it as you know it's a bit lighter. You know, it's just you use it until it's not usable anymore if you lose it or whatever then it's just you can replace it uh, case in point do you know a guy called jack pearson no no does doesn't ring a bell oh he's like um he's a real top nashville session player he's got solo albums out and stuff as well but you know he's played with like tons of people allman okay. brothers and spring to mind you know um he's played with them um like loads of loads of top nashville sessions he plays a stock Squire Bullet Stratocaster. No way. That is his main guitar, a, a, the cheapest of the cheap Bullet Strat. He says you've got to shop around and get a good one because there's there's some that, that are pretty rough. But he says you get a good one of those, and he says he just he's always on the lookout for. And the only mod that he does to it is on the white pick guard. He puts black. A black volume control, so you can read it more easily. That's the only mod, and he doesn't change the pot; he just changes the knob. Who was who the guy? What, what's I've got to research him. Jack Pearson. Jack Pearson. I'm going to make a note of that. Jack, that's phenomenal. 
Mm-hmm. That's phenomenal. I, 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 I yeah. an amazing tone. Wow. Yeah, that's that's ph- phenomenal. I, I, I saw Rhett's uh, video recently. He did one where he just grabbed one of the Chinese-made casinos. Yep. Um, he was inspired by the Get It Be uh, movie that came out. So he grabbed one, and he, and, he, and he played it, and he said it was pretty good. You know, it, you know, but he, you know, being who he was, you know, he decided to change the pickups, mm-hmm. and he did a video on that change the pickups, and he said it's just made it alive a little bit, you know, more it breathes a little bit more, and he said it's just one of his favorite guitars, and that's just a made in China, cheapish yep. kind of guitar. Yep, yep. I mean, you know, it's in one way, it's it's you know all fogies like us can marvel at the fact that you know um this is this is amazing the quality you can get for kind of low prices these days but think back you know think back to you know what cars were like in the late 70s you know i mean you want electric windows on your car you know in in 1979 how much are you going to pay it's like you know find a car without them now you know it's so it's um you know and Essentially, we've got to the point now where I'm probably simplifying this quite a lot, but you'll know what I mean. Uh, we've got to a point where, you know, you, you've got a machine where you feed a plank of wood in at one end and it spits out um, a perfectly sanded and finished, you know, guitar body or neck at the other, or perfectly shaped bo- body or neck at the other end. So, you know, all the hit, holes drilled in the right place, all the cavities cut to millimeter precision. So you're going to get rid of that, um, you know, hungover Monday morning or in a rush to get out of the factory Friday afternoon kind of workmanship, you know, Um, because it's it's just all done CNC these days or a large part of it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, the consistency now between... You know the guitar, uh, the guitars. It, you, you know it's 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 pretty similar. But uh, no, that's that that's interesting. I've got to tell you too one other little thing, and this isn't a go at Gibson. You know the Gibson that I got the Les Paul. It took me forty years, John, to get a Gibson. It took me forty years. I got it in two thousand and nineteen, um, and and I had a lot of uh, you know guitars to get to that point. Um, and I wasn't too happy with it, John, when I got it, you know, uh, and, and Simon here, one of my co-hosts, he's in the chat, he'll back me up. I kind of said to him, you know, I, I, I'm kind of feeling like, uh, you know, so I forked out more money. I got some um, of the Bethnal Green pickups uh, from Monty's Guitars. So um, he, he did a wonderful video on Anderton's where he um, studied Peter Green's uh, Les Paul when it was in the UK and did some tests on it as much as he could. And so he um, offered for sale what he considers faithful reproduction. So so I got those and put those in it. And finally, John, and this is one of the great things too that you can even do with the established brand guitars, you can make some modifications to make it sound better than just that plank of wood that you you know that that it was, and 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 that's all it was. You know, mm-hmm. it was a plank of wood. It, it might, 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 uh, put a fifties loom in it as well, and change the pickups. And and now it's now it's doing everything in my ears, John, that mm-hmm. I wanted this guitar to do when I bought it, but wasn't doing. Yeah, yeah. It's. I mean, I'm. I, I sold my last Les Paul in 92 um because i was broke basically and uh, then i went um i went through various les paul style guitars i had harley bentons i had vintage i had um what's the brand tanglewood um, oh, yeah. you know, various different uh, les paul style guitars and never really connected with any of them and then um just this year i you know 30 years after selling uh, me old Les Paul, I bought this this tribute here, and um, it's a good one. Um, you know, it's it has a superpower. This guitar, uh, let me hold it up again. This guitar has a unique superpower. Um, all of the Gibson haters kind of hate that word on the headstock, 
and all of the Gibson purists um, hate it because it's not a, because it's not a standard. Um, so its superpower is that it can it can I'm going to swear here it can piss off the most amount of people. Um, <laughs> you know because it's like every it's you know and uh this is something that i find on on youtube as well which is uh there is never a shortage of people who know how how you could have spent your money better um you know but hey it's it's a lovely guitar and um it's as i said after 30 years it's the uh it's the les paul that i um that i was waiting for but never really got on with any of the yeah, enjoyed them for a while but but you know kind of once that new guitar novelty factor has worn off it it just kind of ends up hanging on the wall there's one behind me that's um shortly for the exit that's um that's that's fallen victim to that um but i mean this one it's yeah it's the, i have this i have my signature guitar let me just grab that thank you john uh, I have this one. That this is, is this is number one guitar. This is the one I play most of all. Um, a beautiful guitar made for me by uh, Scott Guitars UK, um, and real boutique instrument for um, you can. I mean, I paid for this. You know, I didn't get a freebie. Uh, but if you want one of these, it's about the same sort of money as um, an American professional Telecaster. Um, um, you know, so that's that's the number one guitar, and this one here, that the Les Paul, I won't hold up again. You've seen it yeah. a couple of times. That is the number two guitar, and then for when I want to do strappy kind of things, this is the baby here. Um, wow, Larry Sire, Larry Carlton S seven. Um, oh. You, I mean, just seriously, if, if you pick this up and if you didn't know it was a £400 guitar, you would swear it was a two two grand guitar. Uh, oh. Absolutely stunning. Boutique guitar, at sort of squire kind of money. Um, they're, they're stunning guitars. Roasted maple, locking tuners, you know, everything that you, everything, all of the sensible um kind of upgrades that you would want on on a strat style guitar I, I absolutely love that but um it's the guitar that got me back into strats again actually no problem no problem there's a guy in the chat called ian luckett saying hi nelson um uh, he came to offer his support to mr robson and he's finding other people that he knows obviously from other uh, shows in the chat here um hanging out with us so thanks ian if you are uh, new to our channel, please subscribe. Hit that subscribe button before you leave, please. And um, everyone that subscribes to our channel, I have to remind you, if you're watching a replay, everyone who subscribes to our channel gets a subscription back. We don't ask for subscriptions without giving a subscription back. Thank you. Um, look, look. I think that's phenomenal, uh, John. About um, you know doing that research and giving that kind of experience um, for people over the internet because you, you know it's a fact of life now. When I'm going to buy something that's music related, especially, I jump on the YouTube, John, yep. and I and, and 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 I do some research there because generally speaking, the guy at the music store he doesn't know too much or her generally speaking i don't want to be too too disrespectful um but but I, I i certainly do my research and 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 listen to what guys like you say what some of the guys around anderton says what what shane from in the blues has got to say because basically basically um you gotta be a little bit attuned to it because it's if if it is something that they think may not be up to scratch they won't clearly say that but you've got to listen and pick up on some of the words that they might use to, to describe it, John. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not going to name names here, so don't even ask me to. But there is sure. okay. there is one YouTube channel that we all know that um, who does give. You know, you <laughs> you, you you could uh, you could mail him a dog turd and he'd give it a glowing review. You know. Um, but as I say, I'm not going to name names, but I think <laughs> we all know the channel I mean. 
Yeah, yeah. It's interesting that you should talk about Les Paul guitars before too, because um, I, I, again, we're, we're we're not into bashing anybody on our channel, and nor is John. But you, you know, we're just we're just talking about observations, and and you know, I'm sure everybody can appreciate that. But I, I was watching um, um, a channel a while ago, and uh, one of the guys uh, was a, was a guest, and he'd never owned a Les Paul in his life, John. Mm -hmm. um, he'd always owned '80s style guitars, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Super Strats with Ford Roses. Anyway, uh, one of the co-hosts said, "Look, you you got to get a Les Paul. You know, you've got to get. You know, you've got all these other guitars. You got to get a Les Paul." And one of the other co-hosts said, yeah, 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 go and get it. So anyway, a couple of weeks go by, I jump on, I watch uh, the replay. The guy goes and buys a Les Paul. But he just doesn't buy any Les Paul, John. He buys an R9, you, you know, <laughs> which is, yeah, you know, serious money for a, for, a, for a Les Paul. But clearly the guy can, you know, afford it. So he's, he's talking about this uh, Les Paul and he's going, wow. You know, he, he's he's actually had a Les Paul. He's been playing it for three or four days. He, he, he can appreciate the difference between the Les Paul as opposed to all these other guitars, which clearly there is a difference. But when you've got it at home and you're playing it, well, you know, you're going to bond with a little bit um, uh, deeper. Anyway, uh, the two co-hosts that suggested that he gets a Les Paul, one of them's got a couple of Les Pauls, and there were a couple of guys in the chat saying to the other guy, Show us your Les Paul. Show us your Les Paul because, you know, you're telling people to go out there and buy Les Pauls. That they, They're not a man unless they've got a Les Paul. Um, where's your Les Paul? <laughs> and, you know, but clearly, you know, he didn't have one. But th that was the point, you know. So um, at, at least if you're going to be offering advice, you know, on, on something, well, you know, back it up. And, and, and you know, clearly John does. Well, you know, it's the, the the other thing that I've been very fortunate in is that um, yeah, you know, thirty years I've been doing this job as a guitar teacher. Where has that time gone? Um, wow! And you know, in that time, as I say, for a large part of that, I mean, a, a large part of it now is is doing Zoom lessons. Um, okay. But that, that's fairly recent. But um, you know, up until say about five six years ago it was just people coming to the house for guitar lessons bringing a guitar with them so i you know i've got i've had the chance to um to have a just a, a quick play and a, and a quick look and um, maybe sometimes an extended play of uh, a lot of different uh, guitars so you know it's when people ask me well what's this particular make of guitar like have you ever played oh yeah there was that guy a couple of years ago who brought one of those to the lesson and you know so i can i've usually got some experience of um having hands-on with a, a particular instrument you know um and these days <laughs> somebody will bring a guitar to a lesson i'll say you fancy a free lesson you know, yeah okay well lend me your guitar so i can do a video with it <laughs> yeah 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 and i i yeah and that's uh, another great thing that you do as well, uh, Greg Zeppelin in the chat saying he found you when he was looking into the spa camp and uh, watched your review and stayed. Um, good video. So, so uh, Greg Zeppelin, uh, yeah, great friend of the of, of the channel. But yeah, that's one thing that I noticed that you do talk about that. You know, you do reviews. You get you talk about you know some of your students' guitars, which is fantastic. Um, it's a it's a good thing to do. Thirty years, John, you've been teaching guitar. Yeah, ninety two. I started um it was i mean the, the master plan for me was uh, i studied um marine telecoms at college uh that was what i was going to do i was going to go to sea as a as a radio officer in the merchant fleet um yep but the, the one the one fly in the ointment the spanner in the works was i was absolutely hopeless at morse code just could not do it um so i took the uh the electronics qualifications and uh Went and worked in the electronics industry for two or three years, just working as a lab technician. And then in the early 90s, 91, I got, um, there was a bit of a recession and I, you know, I, I kind of found myself out of work. So it was um, the, uh, 
it was it was the the gigging and as i said earlier that the sideline of teaching that was uh that, that i was relying on to pay the rent and gradually the teaching took over um but yeah 30 years ago was when uh, i first put the ad in the local paper offering guitar lessons awesome do you do um any guitar repairs or um setups or anything like that is that is that a service that you offer or is it just something you just do watch, for your watch, own guitars watch this space um ah. If I just if I if I can pick you up and take you on a tour, um, you see this is this is as well as being my workspace. This is uh, our spare bedroom. Sure. We've got that that kind of cupboard full of junk there. Yeah, uh, that is shortly to be leaving leaving the building, and there's going to be a workbench in there uh, where I'm going to I'm going to do a few a few practice things. I can pretty much do all aspects of. You know, because of my electronics background, the whole kind of yeah. wiring stuff is 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 a is a breeze. Um, the only thing I've never ever had the, I've never taken a big enough brave pill to do is a refret. Um, so I want I want to get a few kind of um, cheap clunker guitars, Faisleys or Glarys or something like that, and practice doing refrets on. Uh, and then in the next. Next couple of years, probably once I get set up for it and, and, and as I say, get confident in my own abilities to do that, then that'll be like I can do setups, I can do everything up and to and including refrets. So, <clears throat> so that'll be something that'll be uh, coming in the near future. Awesome. Well, keep us uh, informed and um, what, what we'll do if you guys um, um, haven't already picked up and if you are watching a replay, we'll include on our uh, channels page, we'll include John's channel. So, um, again, we recommend a few uh, 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 subscribers to our channel to go to our channels page and subscribe to all our friends' channels there. I just want to do a quick shout out, to, uh, John. We've got Brad Cook from Melbourne in the chat. He's one of the co-hosts that uh, joins us uh, here on the channel. Uh, Brad, myself, and also Simon, the rock professor, who was here earlier on. So um, it's the three hombres, um, and uh, you know, no normally we do a couple of shows um, a week together, but this uh, special that we're doing with you uh, today, they've entrusted me um um to, to to look after you and uh hopefully hope hopefully get you back for uh for another show but um look i appreciate the fact john that that you've spent some time with us uh, i've got a couple of other quick questions your your favorite three albums your desert island your desert island albums john and 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 if you can't if you can't give us three, we'll stretch it up to five. Okay, right. <laughs> Let's go for the three. Well, you've got to have Layla and other assorted love songs. You've Good. got to have you've got to have Hard Road. Um, you've got to have. I would say, yeah, I would find it difficult to live without the first Boston album. Oh. Um. And. Uh yes, it, it, I'm not struggling to think of the next two. I'm struggling to think of the next two hundred. Um, what else would I, would I have to have? Um, yeah, Miles Davis, kind of blue, and uh, and probably, probably, I would have to have Dark Side of the Moon. Oh wow, wow! Okay, so I'm not surprised that you picked um, "Kind of Blue." We, we've we've spoken about that album here on this channel a couple of times. My dad loved that album, so I, I was bored up listening to that album. But uh, Boston, Boston, yeah, you know, great album. It's a great album. That's a surprise though, because it's one that doesn't come up often. Oh, it's, I mean, I, there was a video I did yesterday. Uh, well, I didn't do it yesterday. We went live yesterday. I was talking about um, bands where you only need one album. And that first Boston album is is the, the just the quintessential example of that. You know, it's just there. there's not a track on it you want to skip. But, you know, 
just nothing they ever did afterwards was ever in the same league really I, it's for me it's just distilled quintessential essence of melodic 70s rock guitar and you know I, I if you haven't seen it what watch Rick Beato's uh, breakdown of more than a feeling um, and you realize the work that went into that into that one track and well the whole album and it was done by Tom Schultz largely in his basement you know ridiculous in 1976 you know yeah yeah so we didn't know that um at the top well i did i wasn't listening to the album when it was dropped in 76 but certainly about 80 81 i was listening to that album um it was you know through friends and we just thought like everybody else it was a band because there was no internet back then john yeah. we didn't have this information about how this stuff came through and then it was a few more years later where you realized actually it wasn't like a band you know the band was formed after the album basically was recorded yeah. and it was like oh wow yeah Done in a basement with 1976 technology, cobbled together by a mad professor inventor. You know, ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, can, I, I tell you what, if we ever rank that album um, on our show, would you come on as a guest? Oh, um, yeah. Just as, as tell a, me what. As a yeah, guest um, and rank that album with us. We'll, we'd love to have you on. Um, oh, definitely. I'm up for that. Or, Awesome, awesome. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure my other co-hosts would like that. Uh, Ian's asking one question for John. Really, how far is Bear O'Clock, mate? Well, it's Wednesday now, so it's all downhill to the weekend, isn't it? Um, you know, it's, um, you know, it's. I sit in this little hot, stuffy room for up to thirteen hours a day. And you know, Friday and the cold beer can can never come soon enough. But yeah, um, I, I I do like a beer on a Friday. That's to be said. Yeah, good on you, good on you. Well, look, um, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure you guys uh, joining us um, um, for for the past hour and twenty minutes hanging out with John. We really appreciate the fact that we've had someone here. Um, John, we do get um, a lot of people because of the time zone differences that come back and watch um, our videos for some some strange reason. So we're always happy with the fact that people do that. So um, like I said a couple of times during the course of this video, um, after this I'll edit the video with all of John's contact details. If you want to touch base with John and get lessons, Skype lessons off John, hit him up. Um, I've, I've never taken a lesson off him through Skype, but I've used his videos many times to work out riffs and, and, and also, you know, how, how to, how to connect the pentatonic boxes um, from a fast perspective, you know, and without all the theory on how to do it. So, but he also gives you that opportunity too, because if you want to do the theory, here's this, here it is. So it cover all the bases. Two, um, two and, words. Two words that cut the uh, the viewers in half. You put theory or jazz in the title of a video. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if you want advice, obviously too, if you're new to um, buying guitars, or if you if you ever want to get any advice on on something from 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 a guy that's not going to bullshit you, you know, um, drop John a message. You know, flick him a message. I'm sure he'll offer it any any of his um, advice to anybody that asks the questions indeed yes um john robson music.co.uk that's where you'll find me easier we'll attach that uh john zd351 is um he he's a funny guy he's saying he'd like to book a zoom refret <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my Lord. But yeah, good luck, though, John, to um, uh, get in the reference. I think the fact that you're going to buy some cheap necks and have a go um, yeah. certainly is, is the key because I've had a couple of guitars uh, refretted by a local guy here in Hamilton, and I have to tell you the difference between, you know, um, uh, what it does, a good refret to a guitar. It just, boy, it's a big change in the tone. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, my main guitar for many a year was a 
remember those Japanese uh, 60s reissue strats that were out in the in the early 90s? I had one of those refretted with uh, bass frets, and it was just a beast of a guitar after that. It was real, a real kind of rock machine. Awesome, awesome. Okay. Uh, guys, we, we're going to, um, um, obviously, uh, John has said live in front of everybody that he'll come back and he'll rank Boston's first album with us. So we're going to probably lock that in. Uh, that won't be too far away. I, I know that John is busy. We normally do that uh, on a Sunday here, which is um, Sunday morning for you, John. So so that's normally when we do it. So hopefully, hopefully we can pick a Sunday that... Uh, that you're not going yeah, to be doing good. doing anything, and uh, w- would love to get you on, but um, I'm I'm going to wish everybody in the chat um, all the best. Keep safe, and um, please subscribe to everybody that's on our uh, channels page. It's really important because there's some good channels on there, and uh, I'm going to give the last word to uh, John, and uh, we'll wish you guys all the best, John. Oh, I just want to say thanks for having me on. Um, I've been watching your your videos now for well a little while. Uh, gosh, a couple of months, a couple of three months ago when you when you first cropped up in me suggestions, and um, just you know when you offered me the chance to come on, I jumped at it. So thank you very much. It's been a blast. Massively no enjoyed problem. it. No problem. We'll, we'll get you back, um, John, and you can come on and uh, hang out with us and at least rank the albums with uh, The Rock Professor and Brad. That'll be a great show. All Indeed. the best, everybody. Be safe. Bye-bye. <laughs>